For our last lesson of the semester, we're going to talk about free radical reactions. Now, this sounds like a politically uh, based lesson, but I'll assure you that the free radicals in this case are purely molecular. So our learning goals, we'll learn what is a free radical and why is it so reactive. We'll also learn a little bit about why free radical chemistry is very important in our lives. So what is a free radical? It's basically a molecular species that has an unpaired electron in its valence shell. So unlike most of the things that we've talked about for the last two semesters, um, those things all have a closed valence shell, or at the very least, they have pairs of electrons that are uh, paired with one another. In this case, we have an unpaired electron, okay? So it has a vacancy in the same orbital as that unpaired electron. So what sorts of things can happen? I mean, this has an odd number of electrons. Well, you can imagine that uh, we have a species like uh, X, which has an unpaired electron, that it can then encounter an alkane like HR. And with that unpaired electron, it can reach out to hydrogen, grab one of the electrons that's in the bond that hydrogen has to R, and make a new bond to hydrogen, leaving R with now an unpaired electron. So this is part of the reason why free radicals are so reactive. They can react with just about anything. Um, doesn't require a special functional group or anything like that. They can react with just about anything. Now, where do they come from? Well, one of the places that we make uh, free radicals, and this is in an intentional sense, is through the photolysis of halogens. What does photolysis mean? It basically just means we're using light to break a bond. So a chlorine-chlorine bond, uh, when you shine light on it of the right wavelength, uh, can break into two chlorine atoms. And those two chlorine atoms, as, as uh, halogens will, have seven valence electrons, but one of those electrons is an unpaired electron with a vacancy. Now, where might we find free radicals? Uh, you know, is this something that you only find in exotic places, or is it something you can find just about anywhere? Well, virtually every living organism has free radicals in it. And in fact, you may have heard something about the effect of radicals on your health and on aging. They're also present in high energy environments. Anytime you have a lot of energy, there's the possibility of breaking bonds. And oftentimes when bonds break, they, they break in such a way as to form two, uh, basically two free radicals. They are found in the atmosphere. And in fact, this is something we'll talk about uh, toward the end of this lesson the importance of their presence in the atmosphere and what it means for us. They're also present in industrial laboratories. And in fact, uh, free radicals are used for some very important industrial processes. So it's not something that we should uh, fear because it's unusual, but something that we can use for our own purposes. Now, there are three types of elementary reactions that uh, all free radicals can do. So you can think of this as being like a, a a one-stop shop for free radical me uh, mechanisms, reaction mechanisms. You can have an initiation step in which you break a bond, and you break a bond in such a way that you create two free radicals out of breaking that bond. Each one takes one of the two electrons that are shared in the covalent bond. You can then have propagation, and that's something we showed on the previous slide, where you have a reaction of a free radical with a filled shell species. And then when they're done with the reaction, the free radical has formed a new bond to uh, an atom, and what it has left behind is the thing that atom used to be attached to now is a free radical itself. So this can keep going for quite some time, and you can get a number of these reactions to basically file, pile up on each other in domino-type fashion. Finally, you can have a termination step, and that happens when two free radicals come together and they form a new bond, and then both of them now have an even number of electrons in a filled valence shell. So this is what ultimately stops that free radical uh, propagation process. Here's a good example of free radical uh, propagation. A lot of polymers these days are made in industry using free radical process. Now, um, I want to use as an example polyethylene. Now, polyethylene is a pretty boring polymer. It's just a long straight chain hydrocarbon. It's like the world's longest alkane molecule. Okay, each one of the bends in that is a carbon atom that's attached to two hydrogens and uh, goes on for thousands and thousands of atoms. Well, how do you make something like that? How can you possibly find a long chain hydrocarbon like that or stitch it together? Well, the answer is you can use free radicals and it's actually a fairly simple process. So here's what it might look like. 
Let's suppose you start off with something like methyl chloride and you use photolysis to break the carbon chlorine bond. What you've done now is you've created a methyl radical, the CH3 dot, and a chlorine atom, which is also a radical. Now, that methyl radical can be uh, added to a batch of uh, ethylene, so C2H4, and each time it comes up to that ethylene, it takes one of the uh, two electrons that's forming the pi bond, and it forms a new carbon-carbon bond. And the other one of those electrons that's in that pi bond uh, ends up being a radical on the other carbon. <clears throat> so in effect, you end up in the second reaction with a new radical, but now that new radical is three carbons long. That can then undergo subsequent reactions. So the third step is it undergoes a reaction with another ethylene molecule, and it forms an even longer chain uh, free radical. And that can go on and on and on many times and propagate until you get the long chain of the polyethylene. So this is what the last step is showing, is basically you're going to keep making you know, this long chain polymer until it encounters another methyl group or perhaps a chlorine group, and you end up uh, terminating the chain, and that's the end of your polymer synthesis. So this is a very successful way of making long chain polymers, and you can make all kinds of plastics and other things using this sort of free radical uh, technique. A process very similar to the one used to produce polyethylene also can be used to produce a fluorinated analog of that, <coughs> excuse me, polytetrafluoroethylene, which is also known as Teflon. Now, Teflon, as you probably know, is a nonstick surface, and what makes it a nonstick surface? Well, those carbon fluorine bonds are all very strong and they're very polar. So each of them, ha each of the fluorines has a, a little bit higher electron density on it, and so that um, prevents it from uh, getting too close to other things, so it's hard for other reactants to get close, but it's also hard for them to break the carbon-fluorine bond. And so this is a very useful substance, uh, especially, say, in cooking, when you don't want to have a lot of uh, overcooked food sticking to your pots and pans. Now, I've drawn some molecules at the bottom which uh, have a different sort of... Uh, use in our technology. These are all uh, molecules that we call freons as a class. Freons are molecules that have uh, particular thermodynamic properties that allow them to be used as refrigerants. And these have been very handy for us as we've developed uh, our, our uh, industry for refrigeration and it enables us to keep food cold and uh, preserve its uh, freshness for much longer. Uh, there are some problems with these though and those are problems that we'll get into in just a moment. Uh, I, I will point out in particular that those molecules that do not have any hydrogens are particularly hardy. They're like Teflon. They do not uh, tend to undergo reactions here in the troposphere. So they uh, survive for some time, and since they tend to be, uh, especially the smaller ones, tend to be gaseous, they tend to drift up into the atmosphere. So in order to understand the true effect that these molecules have on our atmosphere and, and indirectly on our lives, we need to learn a little bit of something about the atmospheric chemistry. So in the atmosphere, the atmosphere is made up of several layers, and uh, basically those layers are, are labeled according to, uh, well, I don't know what this is according to, but the troposphere is where we live. It's the part of the atmosphere that's closest to the ground. Um, at the very top end of the troposphere, and before we get into the stratosphere, uh, is the ozone layer. So that's where we find ozone in our atmosphere. Um, in the troposphere, uh, where we live, that's where airplanes fly, um, uh, although some jet aircraft even get up into the stratosphere a little bit. Um, the stratosphere is also where weather balloons go um, and, uh, you know, uh, military jets and things like that. Above the stratosphere is something called the mesosphere. That's in the area above 50 kilometers, and uh, that's where um, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles go. Uh, meteors come into the mesosphere, but usually uh, most of them burn up there. Some of them do make it to the ground, uh, but most of them burn up there. And then at the, above the mesosphere, in the area above about 85 kilometers, is the thermosphere. And, and that's actually where the aurora borealis uh, is found. All right, so this gives you a, a very quick summary of what you find in the atmosphere, and we're going to be focusing on that layer between the stratosphere and the troposphere, known as the ozone layer. Now, in order to understand the importance of the ozone layer, um, 
what I'm going to need to do is talk a little bit about the ozone cycle, and then we'll uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what happens to the ozone cycle under certain conditions. In that ozone layer, we have the following reactions occur. Um, the first is a reaction that is the dissociation of diatomic oxygen that forms two oxygen atoms. So we can think of that as a free radical initiation step. Okay, an oxygen atom can then uh, encounter an oxygen molecule and produce ozone, and it tends to give off heat. It's an exothermic reaction uh, when it does that because it's forming a new bond. Um, ozone itself can, can absorb ultraviolet light, and when it does so, it breaks into oxygen molecules and oxygen atoms. And then we can also have a termination step that involves an ozone molecule uh, encountering an oxygen atom and forming two diatomic oxygen molecules. So this is an entire cycle that both creates ozone and destroys ozone. Um, the, uh, the thing that's written on here is H nu, nu is a Greek letter, um, is, uh, is meant to indicate a case where uh, light is absorbed or there's some sort of photolytic process that's going on. And we can see that the net of this ozone destruct, uh, sorry, this ozone process is the conversion of light into heat. All right. Now I want to really stress that all of this is a natural process. There's a fast production of ozone and a slow radiative destruction. So ultimately, what happens is that there is an equilibrium that has occurred um, between the formation of ozone on the one hand through reactions of oxygen atoms with oxygen molecules and the destruction of ozone uh, either via photolysis or by reacting with oxygen atoms. So this is all completely natural. And because it's an equilibrium, that means that there is a constant concentration of ozone in the stratosphere, at least theoretically. Now what happens when we have these chlorofluorocarbons, the halogenated hydrocarbons or freons? Well, if they don't have hydrogen attached to them, if it's just chlorines and fluorines attached to the carbon, uh, what can happen is that they diffuse into the upper atmosphere and they're not changed. Uh, they aren't destroyed because those carbon-halogen bonds are very strong and so they resist all of the chemistry that might occur to them down in the troposphere and they get up into the stratosphere, well they get up into the ozone layer in the stratosphere and now they are high enough that they can uh, be exposed to sunlight and so then what happens is they do undergo some chemistry, they undergo photolysis. Sunlight will basically carve a chlorine atom off of the chlorofluorocarbon and it leaves a free radical of chlorofluoro chlorofluorocarbon uh, radical and chlorine atoms. Well, the chlorofluorocarbon radical uh, you know, may cause some problem, but it's really the chlorine atoms that causes the problem that we worry about. It basically initiates a chain of radical reactions. So consider the following. The chlorine atoms will react with ozone. They form ClO and diatomic oxygen. So this is one place where they destroy ozone. <clears throat> we can also have this uh, chlorine oxygen compound reacting with oxygen atoms to produce oxygen diatomic molecules and more chlorine. And this can happen over and over and over again to propagate uh, the free radical steps. And then we have that oxygen atom uh, also reacting with ozone to create two oxygen molecules. So it's sort of the termination step, which is also an ozone destruction step. So the whole point is that these uh, reactions that can occur in the atmosphere uh, have the net effect of converting two ozone molecules into three oxygen molecules. But I also want you to notice that the chlorine is not actually used up in this process. <clears throat> it looks like it is because we have, uh, you know, we have on the one hand, uh, you know, if we just added these things up, there would be no chlorine in it. But in fact, the chlorine is not used up. It's a catalyst for this process. And that's where the bad news is, because each chlorine atom participates in thousands of ozone molecules that are converted to diatomic oxygen. So the effect of this is not to destroy all the ozone, but it shifts the equilibrium that naturally occurs in the upper atmosphere so that there is less ozone there at particular times of year. Now, it is a seasonal thing that happens. Uh, it typically happens in the springtime when ice in the stratospheric clouds 
um, is beginning to melt a little bit and it's releasing some of the chlorine that has attached to those uh, ice particles in the clouds. And that's when you begin to see ozone destroyed more, so that's why you see an ozone hole that appears at particular times of the year. Um, those ozone holes then are, are replenished with ozone uh, at later times of the year. But uh, it, is a seasonable pro it is a seasonal process, but one that we should be very concerned about. And in fact, we have been very concerned about it. Um, I will say that there is some good news. The polar vortex limits the size of the ozone hole each year, so it, uh, it doesn't appear to expand to cover the entire planet. It's mostly located above the polar regions. And the other good news is uh, about 35 years ago, uh, the Montreal Protocols were adapted by uh, most of the countries in the world, and it identifies ozone-depleting substances, and it uh, calls for their elimination from industrial use. And so that's why we no longer have chlorofluorocarbons typically as our refrigerants, that we have hydrofluorocarbons and other kinds of things that serve as our uh, main refrigerants. Well, that concludes what I have to say about free radical chemistry, but I did want to take this uh, opportunity to review what some of the course objectives were and uh, that I want you to be aware that I think we've covered them all. So the first was to understand the fundamental characteristics of reactions and uh, certainly to be able to identify different types of reactions. That's something that we talked about in the first module, uh, and I hope that you're now able to piece those together. And when you see a chemical reaction, to uh, identify what has happened in the reaction and whether it's an addition or a decomposition or some other type of reaction. We also then, in module two, used mass balance. And we use that as a way of predicting the outcome of a reaction, that is a quantitative outcome of the reaction. If you start off with so much uh, in the way of reactants, how many products will you form? We then uh, learned quite a bit about energy changes in reactions, and we learned how to use tabulated data to predict the enthalpy change that we might expect to see in a reaction. We spent quite a bit of time talking about equilibrium, and so I hope that uh, you now have the ability to predict how a non-equilibrium mixture might shift to restore equilibrium if you have an idea of what the equilibrium constant is. I hope you can also recognize acid-base reactions and uh, certainly be able to recognize conjugate base and conjugate acids that are produced in an acid-base reaction and uh, maybe even predict the outcome of uh, proton transfer in organic, uh, in organic reactions. We then looked a lot at the time evolution and understand the speed and rate of chemical reactions. And I hope you understand uh, how temperature can influence that and how catalysts and, uh, and pressure can also influence the rate of a reaction um, and uh, be able to predict that for certain reactions. Finally, I hope that you are now able to correlate reaction mechanisms and how they are related to the rate of a reaction and recognize some of the different mechanisms that uh, we've talked about here. I've enjoyed having you in class, and I hope you have a successful end of the semester, and I look forward to seeing you in the future when our paths cross. Thank you.